My name is Frank Daly, and uh, you can call me Frank in the interview. Great, and it's spelled how? If you could spell it. My last name? Mm -hmm. D-A-L-Y. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. No additives. And do you want to be called Father, or? You can call me Frank. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. All right. Wonderful. So let's go back in time. Let's talk about how you first got started in the field of business ethics. When was it? What was your role? What were your responsibilities? Fill us in on those early years in this space. Well, I got first got started in 1986. Um, I worked for Northrop Corporation, which was how it was known at the time, about 20 miles from here in Norwood, Massachusetts. And of course, the Defense Industry Initiative took place in the spring of 1986. And so I was working actually in the, uh, in the area of human resources, running a kind of a communication operation, which included, you know, internal, external communications and the preparation of um, uh, proposals, coordinating artists and writers and all of that for the government. And, um, so it came up that we had to start ethics programs because of the uh, the Defense Industry Initiative, and they looked around, and I guess they thought, they realized that I had degrees in philosophy and theology, and, and so, well, why don't, why don't you get involved in it? So that's how I got involved first uh, in, in, in the program. And uh, uh, the management, the management to whom I reported. Yeah. I reported to a, a manager who was kind of a, a real good friend and mentor of mine. Uh, he was a very um, smart, good businessman, uh, driven businessman, but had a high, high level of integrity. So um, it was a nice, nice base from which to start. So what was your title, job title, and what I, did they tell you the job was going to be? I don't know what my job title well, I don't remember actually I'm getting on you know so <laughs> and uh, and um, they actually they didn't I don't think told me tell me what the job was going to be because they didn't know um, you know the government came along and said you have to have these programs with these four or five elements in it and you, you've got to get going and at the time the unit I was working in was under the government's thumb for a major violation. They were in court, actually, at the time, you know, fighting indictments and that kind of thing. So it was even more urgent to, to, in, in that sense. So you said yes to this opportunity. What did you expect your first couple of accomplishments were going to be? What were your goals and objectives for the position? Well, if I, my goals and objectives would have been a little bit different than what management's goals and objectives were at that point. They basically wanted to keep the government from the door. Um, you know, the realist, we have to be realistic about a lot of this started not because CEOs woke up in the morning and had an attack of altruism. Um, it started because there was a violation and the government said, you know, and, and in fact, then that's how it progressed when we got to the, the sentencing guidelines and the incentives were tied into sentencing and all of that. But initially, it was basically the government said you had to do this, and we were in a more difficult position because we had a violation on the books, and we were actually in court working with them. So, so what was your object? What were your early objectives? Early objectives were basically uh, training. Um, you, you know, the objectives set in the Defense Industry Initiative, which were training, hotline, no retaliation, uh, those kinds of things. Someone with responsibility for the program. Um, and, and so that's what we, how we had to start. So. Those sound remarkably like the federal sentencing, federal sentencing guidelines. Well, because the sentencing guidelines, you know, when they did those, they called in people from the DII uh, to kind of pick their minds as to where exactly what they, you know. I mean, I mean, eventually, business and the business ethics people went so far beyond what I think the government ever attained in terms of their understanding, although there were people in the government who were very good at this and very understanding. But uh, event, uh, you know, initially, um, the government basically didn't know what, the, what, you know what they needed to include in order to, to have this particular thing carried out. So. 
So in some ways, the government learned from the experience of those in the defense industry? Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, absolutely. And, and, and there were some very decent government people, as we are seeing, you know, in testimony in, in, in Congress these days, um, who were very open uh, to doing that, to learning and uh, saying, you know, that this is helpful. Now, there were a few of the other kinds around, too. <laughs> so as you, as you can't even imagine. <laughs> as you reflect on those early years then, what were some of the major accomplishments that you had in this role? Well, I think, first of all, we, we, um, we in, in my circumstances, it was getting a kind of training in place and beginning to realize that training was something that we did with machinists and that we really had to have a broader view about this being education and, um, and actually building on um, the basic good values that most people brought to work. So it was that piece, it was setting up a, um, a hotline that was credible because a fair percentage of people are simply skeptical about an organization setting up a line like this. So we had to do something and we had to be extremely careful about confidentiality and protecting sources and things like that. I don't know if it helped, but if they knew that I was a priest, that's kind of part of the business. Were you a priest then? I had been before. No, I knew that. Yeah. yeah. But you were I was before. not then. Okay. Well, theologically I was, but um, no, I mean, in actual I mean, fact, <laughs> functionally, no. no right, 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 right. So as you reflect on uh, some of the challenges in those early years, what were they? How did you overcome them? Well, I think that some of the initial challenges were to kind of see if we could move the understanding of what we had to do beyond simply responding to the law and the oversight of the government. Um, and um, because, you know, if you're put into an emergency situation, namely that you've got a real problem in front of you, all of your energy is going to be directed at uh, answering the problem and taking care of it. So, but there's a certain understanding that there's more to that because how do you solve a problem or how do you communicate something to people uh, when the spectrum of your audience ranges on one end, fourth and fifth grade education, and on the other end, double PhDs. Um, so uh, that was a real challenge uh, from the beginning in order to do that. And, um, and then um, to get beyond the fact, uh, and this, this still hasn't happened in my view, that this is a legal issue um, and that it's best handled by lawyers. So initial codes of conduct, for example, were unreadable. Um, they were unusable by the person, in, 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 you know, the ordinary person working. And so it took a, a, a long, the big challenge was to get to the point where you understand that a code of conduct, for example, is a, not a legal document, it's a document with legal implications. And that has to be, uh, and, and it's not a read-through book. It has to be available for people to refer to if they need to it, et cetera, et cetera. So that, I think that notion, uh, getting beyond, for example, the, the narrowness of of the legal thing. And then the next thing that kind of happened is we got into a competition kind of as to who had the best code of conduct. You know, some people kind of spent money on their codes of conduct. They had it as if they were the code of Hammurabi. And um, in, in fact, it, it's really got to be a simple document that people can read to and refer to. And in many instances, um, be told that if the answer's not here, get help. So those challenges remain today or have been largely solved? Well, I'm retired. I've been retired for a long time, but I suspect, I think they remain. I think the legal thing really remains today because the last data I saw in the past few years says that over 50% of uh, ethics programs are located in law departments. Is that, is that a problem? Yes. 
Um, in my view, ethics program, and, and actually because of the good work and advocacy of the late Mike Hoffman, ethics programs um, have more to do with employee and management development than they have with catching the crooks. Now, it, you know, I, I don't dis lawyer. I worked with some wonderful lawyers and saw very much how, how important they were in this whole process. But if you design your ethics program simply to cover the law, then you're missing an incredible opportunity to capitalize on the good values that people bring to work that they have from the Boy Scouts, from their church, from their school, from the PTO, and, and encourage them to live according to those good values, and thereby, it seems to me, really protect the enterprise and, and build a culture in the enterprise in such a way that you don't have to be scurrying all, that, you know, that people are going to say, uh, so that, that that fifth grade person says, well, I read the, I read the, uh, the code, and I can't get an answer to my question. But you know, I gotta ask someone, this doesn't feel right. This isn't the way we do things around here. How do you create that? That's the real challenge, seems to me. Terrific, thank you. So as you think about developing the program at Northrop over time, right. in the beginning you said, hey, this is because we're under investigation under the government's thumb. Right. But that eventually went away. So talk about how that program evolved, how your role evolved, how the challenges might have evolved. Well, one of the interesting things that happened at Northrop was that um, my predecessor, the late Shirley Peterson, um, either by design or, or serendipitously, and I think it was a little bit of both, the ethics program was introduced at Northrop Grumman, um, and at that time it was Northrop, I think, um, at the same time that we introduced a new management pro emphasis on a new management development program in which we set aside the notion, the old aerospace, the, the old manufacturing notion, on time, on schedule, on cost, but bodies everywhere and blood all over the walls, to a much more collaborative kind of management, et cetera. And so when those two came, we, I actually um, had a, a graduate student from USC did a very quick and somewhat unscientific study of that, randomly choosing managers throughout the company, um, asking the question about what was the relationship of the ethics program uh, to management development. And overwhelmingly, we got responses, I don't know where that study is now, that said that people again and again said, that the management tone that was set for them was set by their manager. And, and they knew that there was a difference in terms of the tone of management that was introduced in the company pretty much simultaneously with, with the ethics program. So. so does the ethics program or did the ethics program continue to have an impact on how those managers managed? Yes, I, I think it did. Um, how so? Well, managers would frequently ask us questions. Uh, they would, um, um, we, we then instituted a program where we had little scenarios and we farmed them out to managers all over the, co uh, the company. Um, and managers, managers who have regular staff meetings regularly don't have enough to fill up the hour of their staff meeting. And so we kind of capitalized on that by giving them scenarios and they would set up, uh, they would split the staff into team and they would read the scenarios and then they would come up with a, with, with a discussion. And we gave them about 16 or 17 scenarios and we got things back, feedback from people that said, um, we really liked that. It was a real addition to our staff meeting and we've decided to do one of those scenarios for the next 17 staff meetings, which, of course, in terms of, uh, I mean, it's so much more valuable than marching people into a room and sitting them down for an hour. So we did those kinds of things, and, 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 and then we, encouraged, we gave managers a lesson plan, encouraged them to do it. And if 
for whatever reason, the manager didn't want to do it. We offered to, to do it for him, but he had to be in the room so that the, the employee could say, well, remember that scenario we did? You got this problem. Remember that scenario? This is what we talked about. You were in on that. What gives? That kind of thing. So as you look back on, on your career in ethics and compliance, and what did you call it? Ethics, compliance? We actually called it, um, my title at the end, I think, I don't remember, um, was ethics, uh, I think I was the corporate director of ethics and values. Because also at the time that we introduced the ethics program, we introduced values. So we had the standard values that most people, integrity, leadership, you know, concern for others, that kind of thing. And the values were, were very, very important. And, and for me, um, again, the values kick in where you have this broad spectrum of people, some of whom may have access and can find out what the, um, uh, what the law is or what the regulation is, and the others don't, can't. But it's the knowledge of the values that says to them, you know, maybe I should ask someone a question about this. Uh, so um, having an ethics program, it seems to me, that's simply based on rules isn't going to get you very far. So if you were going to name this role today, what would you call it? Um... I think I'd call it something like some combination of ethics in business. Um, you know, the shorthand is business ethics. But ethics is a set of basic um, standards uh, that apply in all sorts of, in medicine, in journalism, etc. And the, the, the standards are, are similar, they're the same. But the setting's different. In the hospital, it's life and death. In business, it might be, you know, sending your kids to college and having a job. Um, in, in journalism, it might be, you know, your reputation or the reputation of someone um, that you have an obligation uh, to treat well or, or, or to protect. But the basic rules are the same. So I always favored, if I was talking about it formally, talking about ethics in business. But, you know, for shorthand, business ethics. I don't think I had role models, but I had mentors that I, you know, uh, my, my boss that I mentioned before, and I hate the word boss, by the way, I should, I'll retract it. Uh, <laughs> it's an awful word. It reminds me of a boss hog and, <laughs> you know, the Dukes of Hazard and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, well, you could use supervisor, my manager, or the officer I reported to, or, or John. Um, he, he, was, uh, he was a very admirable man. Uh, I, uh, interesting enough, celebrated his funeral mass last October. Uh, he lived in Manchester, New Hampshire, and died at the age of 90. Um, but he was a very admirable man. He was very competent. He was very precise in what he did. Uh, uh, for instance, um, he used to say, Frank, you and I are the only two in this place who can write. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I was going to say, well, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, and John, I'm better than you are, but I didn't say that. <laughs> I had an old friend who said, Frank, there's times you have to put your principles aside and do what's right. <laughs> so, and, and, and so I, he, he and I, he used to write arbitration, labor arbitration briefs, and then I would work on them with him. And one time he asked me to write the brief. And he wouldn't sign it without me signing it as well. So that, that's the kind of person. So he was, he, for me, he was uh, someone very much to look up with and to be happy that I was working with. Other people that were really influential and helpful as mentors in this whole thing was Mike, Mike Hoffman, who was the, the director of this center for over 40 years. And I had the advantage of being only 20 miles away, so I could come here and talk to Mike or call him on the phone. And I came to Bentley for some of those very, very early uh, meet annual meetings he had on, on business ethics. So there were, I, you know, I knew I could always depend on him. 
a Kirk Hansen, who is the retired um, executive director of the uh, Markerla Center for Business Ethics in Santa Clara. He was in, I was involved with him very early. He did some training of me. And then I was later in my career when I was um, at the corporate headquarters in La of Northrop Grumman in Los Angeles, I was a fellow at the Markula Center at Santa Clara. So, so those were uh, some of the people I thought that were, um, yeah, really uh, helpful and you know. Connected with the academic community, did they have an influence on the way that you did your job or thought about your job at Northrop Grumman? Um, I, I, yes, I, I think so. They. Um, you know, they, they were pushing away from the narrow view of legalism. And, um, and then, in a sense, they sewed with me, for instance, that at that point in time, for the most part, it was very interesting because business ethics uh, did not have the impact in business that other academic disciplines did that the relationship between business ethics and those people who studied business ethics in academia was not, there wasn't that relationship. And in fact, there were some people in academia and in other places who were somewhat cynical about the fact that you could even do business ethics. You know, the, old, the oxymoron thing. Um, that always puzzled me to some extent because, you know, from my background, I know that um, there isn't any area of human endeavor that's immune from, the scru from ethical scrutiny. And, and here's an area of human endeavor that consumes one third of the time of most people. So um, uh, the, I, I was always conscious and, and somewhat involved with you know, I taught uh, courses in business ethics at uh, Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. I made presentations in a lot of places. I made presentation once in San Diego at the, I think we met there probably, Pat, at um, um, the Society for Business Ethics. Uh, and, and that, and, you know, in regional things in California, that kind of thing, so. As you look back and as you reflect on uh, what might have been, are there any things you say, gee, I wish I, I had done this differently, or boy, I tried that and that just sure didn't work. Anything that uh, you look at and say, Ooh, nobody should do this because? Um, I probably should have made um, a stronger case with management for the the the, pla the legitimate place of this whole enterprise uh, for the success uh, of management and the manage you know and that that the, there was a certain convergence taking place between business ethics and where management training was going um, you know kind of cooperative management emphasis on quality uh, and quality is a promise that you make, which has an ethical content, etc. So that there was this kind of convergence that it seemed to me we could have made a stronger case for. And I don't think we succeeded in that because, you know, you, you know there was, a, there was a, um, a graduate Harvard Business School about 10 years ago who put out some kind of a document in which he tried to get people to sign on to. Um, and uh, it worked, but it died quickly. So um, I don't know what the status is, you know, comprehensively now, but it, um, it seems to me that business ethics goes through this um, rise and fall. Uh, you know, Harvard taught business ethics in the 1920s and then ended it. And then they got religion, you know, when John Shad gave them $30 million because of, you know, some of their graduates not acting so well. Excuse me, Harvard, you're a great place. Uh, I grew up next door to Harvard. And, um, and you know, and, um, you know, Lynn Payne was there and, and you know, et cetera. Uh, but then they had this particular thing and it, it, it went by the wayside. The MBA oath. That yeah, that's right. Yeah. It was Corona yeah. who started that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and, a, group of, and a group of students in the MBA program. Right? They signed. They signed a, a pledge to be professional in a whole lot mm -hmm. of professional things. Right. right. This yeah. Kid died. Yeah. It just died. Yeah. I wonder if it's still active with that group of people who got it started. I wonder if they carried it forward into their yeah, careers. Which is mm -hmm. yeah. It would be an yeah. interesting point. So what challenges remain for people doing business ethics today? I think um, some similar ones, you know, for instance, I always say that um, um, you, can't do, you can't do business ethics and say that profit is bad. Uh, you can't run a business without profit. So if profit is bad, forget it, okay? But it's the place of profit that's important. I used to use the image of it's, um, there's two outs in the ninth inning, and you get up, um, you're the last batter, you're worried you could be the goat or the hero. And so if you get up thinking, I'm going to be the goat, I've got to get this, I've got to do this, I've got to get this profit, I've got to, do this, I've got to win this thing, etc. The odds are higher that you, you won't get the hit. But if you get up and calmly say, well, I've got to do this right, I've got to do that right, you know, I've got to treat my employees well, I've got to work and have a good relationship with my partners, I've got to make a decent product, I've got to be there for my customers when they need me. I, you know, I got to get my stance right. I got to hold the bat correctly. I got to watch the ball as it comes in. The odds that you're going to hit a home run are much better. And so it's the context in which you place profit, it seems to me, that's really important. And there's always the temptation to just drive for it, not to, not to say that, not to have kind of the longer view, if you will, um, in, in, in terms of the pursuit of profit. So. Are there uh, other big issues, big unknowns that we ought to be thinking about? Uh, the, that, the whole digital world, the whole internet world. Um, um, interestingly, some years ago I do the Verizon lecture here, and I did a informal, again, kind of poll, because I'm not a professional pollster, with students, and asked them simple questions like, is it easier to lie to someone on, an e on the email? And overwhelmingly, they said yes. And so, um, it's, so it's easier to deceive. The, the, it's much harder to look someone in the eye and, and lie to them than it is to do it on the. So the question is then, how do we use technology in such a way that it preserves what are be considered decent? treatment of other human beings and not get in the way of that. Um, uh, so in, in terms of the whole human resources area, it seems to me that's a whole area that needs attention, not only in business, but in society in general. Frank, you came out of human resources, you said, yeah, uh, did. into yeah. this role. Was that a common path? Is that a good path? As you think about what makes a good ethics and compliance officer, is that background useful? Not necessary. I, I, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, we, what we did was we, ha we set up, you know, we were scattered. We had large units all over the place. Uh, and, and at one point, even in Europe, we had to start ethics programs in Europe, which is a whole other ball game. Well, we might talk about that yeah. a little bit. And, um, but we had large units. In place. So we selected people to be the responsible person for the ethics thing in a unit, say, of 2,000 employees. And we were more interested in someone who had a certain integrity, recognizable in the organization, and um, we didn't want um, <laughs> uh, them to announce that so-and-so was going to be the ethics officer and have you know, a fair number of employees saying, who? So. So, um, so we, we, we set that up, but we did not have uh, that you have to be in human resources. And we had controllers, people, we had contract people, we had, you know, human resource people, et cetera. It's just that it happened that, that this ended up in Northrop in human resources. One of the interesting things, however, was that we were perceived by the employees, even though we were located in human resources, as being separate from human resources because a fair percentage of our calls that came in 
were human resource calls that they didn't get um, either what they wanted or what they considered fair treatment in, in you from human resources. So. Now, Tom has a question. Well, I was just—I was very fascinated by the title of your book and um, your business ethics paths to certainty. Uh, and I'm mindful of the Taya de Chardin thing about the opposite of certainty is not doubt; it is faith. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us a little bit about why you chose that title in itself? What you mean by certainty? And then, obviously, faith is. is, is you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, but my colleague is the one who chose that title. <laughs> and I actually wasn't high on it. But, you know, I had got to make so many decisions about the book that I said, you know, I've I got to be fair here. Um, and he was very, he, he wanted it to be because he thought that there was a lot of uncertainty about people asking, how do I set a program up? How do I get one going, et cetera, et cetera? And so he wanted, and then chose, you know, this particular graphic that, that um, is, is kind of an Inuit um, monument, so to speak, in, in, in Australia that basically tells you, you know, that you're going in the right direction, that kind of thing. So um, it, uh, you know, uh, it would have been a really nice story if it, came the way <laughs> your question suggests, <laughs> but we are talking about ethics after all. <laughs> what about I mean, the, the role of the faith-based institutions in business ethics in America? You, you've been worked... Uh, with it's, it's almost non-existent. They don't know anything about business, and they think, and it, they have the same, they have, they basically, I don't see any, now... You mean I, the churches? Yeah. I mean, there is a Catholic group called Legatus, which is a businessman's group, which is basically a very conservative uh, Catholic organization uh, that uh, only takes certain high-level businessmen in, in their membership. Um, but they, um, in general, like you, you won't hear, um, I would be really interested in knowing someone who ever heard a homily or a sermon on ethics in the workplace. What about well, I, I, I meant the, well, I was getting at the, the um, mm -hmm. say, the Jesuits' colleges and stuff like that, the co business courses they run there at Marcuse and other places. I mean, it could be, well, Markala, certainly. Um, the interesting thing is there that, you know, Markala, uh, you know, Markala was, um, Mike Markala was the brains behind Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. In other words, they needed a grown-up to run a business because they knew nothing about it. And so Mike Markler was the one. And he don get, donated about $8 million to um, Santa Clara for that center. Um, so um, he, that, that was kind of a, a, a interest because he had a tie into, into the Markler Center, but and then there's a center, the Hilton Center. Um, Hilton's, you know, they were Catholics too, I think, um, and gave a lot of money to the Hilton Business School, and they established that chair at Loyola Marymount University. So there is some connection to it, but in general, um, you know, in, in parishes and things like that, it's rare to, to hear. You, know, you go to a meeting of clergy, and business ethics never comes up. May I say about, you mentioned Mike Hoffman in the early years there. Could you give us the kind of commercial and political context that was happening at the time when, when the, you know, the business ethics first started off here? Well, you know, business ethics, to some extent, go, go, you know, has high points as it goes from um, scandal to scandal. Uh, um, one of, the, one of the nice things, by the way, that's happened with business ethics is there's a network now of people um, uh, throughout. And so there are resources. The media likes to write about ethics when they've got a scandal. And, you know, they don't think to write about it when they have, you know, a really good positive story. But more and more, there are potential places where they could go to learn there is a positive story. 
so, and I think to some extent, um, Mike was, Mike was very media conscious. And um, so he had a presence in this area uh, and sometimes beyond it um, about the, you know, the impact of, uh, you know, uh, business ethics in, you know, of ethics in businesses uh, that perhaps weren't available in other areas. But most, most often he got called when there was a scandal, when there was something negative. So um, I think it's a big story, um, but I don't think it's been, uh, it, it's been covered. And I, you know, and I don't mean to take the position on the media that you know, other people with a much higher profile than I have taken. Frank, did you come here to tell us something in particular, something you wanted to share that we haven't had a chance to touch on? Uh, I don't think so. Um, um, well, maybe, maybe it's this whole point of the importance of outreach. Um, that if you're going to do your little program in your company without outreach and making contact with other companies, other organizations, like I was involved as I was chair of the Ethics Organ Officer Association, I was a member of the, the Working Group of the Defense Industry Initiative. Um, it's in those places that you kind of get the energy, the ideas, etc., cetera, to go, to, to, to go forward. And it's in those places that you create some of the awareness in the larger world that this is a reality. I remember one time uh, the CEO's um, secretary called me and said, uh, Frank, um, um, you made a presentation on a Friday afternoon after lunch uh, to a group in San Francisco. And one of the people who was there was a uh, person who serves on another board with the CEO. And, um, and he called him specifically and said how good it was and that it was amazing, you know, after everyone had a glass of wine or two at lunch that they didn't, on a Friday afternoon, <laughs> that they didn't fall asleep. So it's, it's that kind of thing happening, you know, that, that I think is really important for us uh, to understand in, you know, conferences and all of that kind of thing, journals, that kind of thing that are very important for the, to understand you know, the wider impact of this particular thing. Um, and it's, it's important, I think, for your own company to have a reputation among other companies that this is something that's important to them as well. So. I think that's a powerful point. Pat, did you have other questions? No, no, I think that's it, please. Tom? Can you put a price on ethics? <laughs> Well, for everything else, there's MasterCard. <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, uh, there might be a couple of one. Oh, yeah, uh, you, accomplishments and contributions. One of the things that I was most happy about was that during my, my watch at Northrop Grumman, um, I think I was the only major aerospace company that did not have a significant audit by the government of the program. Um, and That's a pride point. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. And I'm not supposed to do that, you know, because just be a humble parish priest. No, be silly. It's okay to be proud of something. This was this was when you were before. <laughs> I know. Between, between. I, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. This is between my not, shifts. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I, before we go, I do want to go back to something that you said, and I had jotted down a note, and I wanted to follow up. You talked about some of the challenges of taking a program global, and you said, hey, boy, there were some challenges yes. there. Talk a little bit about globalizing what is or was functionally then a U.S. idea. Um, yeah, when we bought Lytton, we bought, uh, before that, we had agents overseas, but... Um, and that, well, that, that's another, if I can divert here a little bit. Um, one of the interesting things to do in, in an organization is, if you're a large organization like we were, like for instance, during the time that I was at Northrop Grumman, we had a, a low of 45,000 employees and a high of 125,000. Um, 
And so one of the interesting things to do in terms of finding ways to get the message out is to find out when the auditors are meeting and get on the agenda. When all the, when all the marketing people from the company are meeting, get on the agenda, etc. Go to the annual meeting and lobby the, boards of, the members of the board of directors before, during coffee, before and after. Talk to them, say, greet them, tell them you know, what you're doing or uh, that kind of thing. So th those are all kind of important things. With respect to the international thing, first of all, in, in, in Northern Europe especially, in Northern and Central Europe, you know, um, hotlines are out. Um, because they're still living with, you know, the drop a dime of the, the Soviets and the Nazis. Um, so calling up on someone, it, it, it's just not something you do. Um, privacy laws are stricter. So in to some extent, they protect the employee better than privacy laws here. Um, the impact of unions, for example, in... in in, in, in European um, business governance is stronger. Um, and that can be an obstacle in terms of putting in place the elements of a program that you need. Um, so we did, we did an annual uh, conference in Europe once we, um, uh, and, and our units were mainly in Europe, in, in Germany and Italy. Um, and uh, we, did, we did conferences in Switzerland and Italy after I left, I think, which is too bad because I studied in Italy for four years and would have loved to have gone back on their nickel. But um, uh, so there, there are complications, and not in terms of the fact that those people are, are less ethically sensitive or anything than we are, but the structures of the culture are very different than some of the structures that we built on. And that makes it, um, you have to be careful and sensitive uh, uh, to those things in their in, in their experience. 